everybody, and welcome to a new video. Do you find that managing your settings in the middle of shooting action is a big pain? I'm asked all the time what my favorite mode to shoot in, and the answer is manual with auto ISO. But some people will say, when I shoot in auto ISO, my camera makes the ISO too high. Uh, no. In this video, I'm gonna show you why it isn't the camera's fault, but ours, the photographer, and the techniques to properly use manual with auto ISO in the field that ensures the right exposure and correct ISO level. If you stay for my bonus tip, I'll share the advanced trick I use to make sure I don't mess up my ISO setting in auto ISO. My name is Simon Dantremont and I'm a Canon ambassador and professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. So first off, what the heck is shooting in manual with auto ISO? That's when you set your camera to manual, which allows you to set the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO independently. But you only set the shutter speed and aperture manually and set the ISO to automatic, which allows the camera to select the ISO for you. I have a whole video on what this is here, which I won't revisit. You can start there, but make sure you come back. This video is about the field techniques on how to properly use this technique. But I will restate three very important points on why I would want to use this technique to get ahead of the comment section in which people will say, full manual is better, etc., etc. One is that yes, full manual offers a great level of control, especially when you have the time to play with your settings. I use full manual for landscapes and astrophotography, no problem. But two, auto ISO allows for faster reaction to dynamic and action sequences than you can in full manual, as it changes the ISO for the conditions in hundredths of a second. Check out this sequence of me shooting these aquatic antelopes called red leshways into the setting sun in Botswana on one of my recent workshops there. The photos are slightly underexposed to protect the highlights just like I intended. Notice how the ISO starts off at 250, but then as the subject moves across the variable lighting in the scene, the camera adjusts the ISO as needed as I keep shooting 12 frames per second. ISO 320, 400, 500, 640, 800, 1000, 1250, and so on, all the way to 3200. This sequence is impossible in full manual, it doesn't matter how good you are. And thirdly, if shooting in a semi-automatic mode is what I want, why not aperture or shutter priority? The answer is important. ISO is the only of the three settings that impact image brightness that doesn't impact the artistic quality of the photo. I want to control the shutter speed as it's important to freeze the action and different scenarios need different shutter speeds. I want to control my aperture as my depth of field is important to my photographic style but the ISO doesn't change any of my artistic choices for my photos. It may make an image quality difference, but not a stylistic one, so it's the only setting I'm prepared to let the camera manage. ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, I don't care. And it can do it way faster than I can. So for me, that's manual with auto ISO when I shoot action or in light that's always changing. But now let's tackle the elephant in the room. If I had a dime for every time someone said, but in auto ISO, my camera chooses too high an ISO, I'd be rich. The reality is the following. Your camera chose, based on your metering mode choice, shutter speed selected, and aperture you chose, exactly the ISO needed to get an appropriate exposure. What's that you may be saying? Auto ISO works by your camera setting the ISO for you. And what ISO needed will be a function of how much light is coming into your sensor. Remember, ISO isn't light, but a digital gain applied to your photo to make it brighter. It has nothing to do with sensitivity like film ASA did. And all things being equal, higher ISO photos are noisier because with more digital gain applied, that means the original photo before ISO applied was darker and hence noisier because of a poor signal to noise ratio, the cause of noise in an image. Now the amount of light to your sensor is dictated by three things. The brightness of the scene, the shutter speed with longer ones letting in more light, and your aperture with larger openings allowing more light onto your sensor. 
Based on the amount of light on your sensor, the camera will then set the ISO to properly expose the photo, which in most cases is getting the brightness level to medium gray, or 18% gray, a gray that reflects 18% of light. This is all done in black and white, so don't worry about colors here. So if we take this photo of mine from earlier, shot in auto ISO, I take this into Photoshop, convert it to black and white, and average out the pixels. What do I get? Voila, 18% gray, just like it was supposed to. So why do people keep saying their cameras are choosing too high in ISO? It's choosing the ISO based on how much light is coming into the sensor. But in manual with auto ISO, who's controlling how much light is coming into the sensor? You are. That's right, you're controlling the shutter speed, you're setting the aperture, and you're deciding to add light to the subject or not with a flash, for example. Which means, and this is the whole point of this video, in auto ISO, the photographer is still responsible for the ISO, as the camera is setting the ISO based on the amount of light on the sensor, which is controlled by the photographer. You may not be setting the exact ISO, but by your shutter speed and aperture settings, you're deciding if your ISO is low, medium, or high. If the ISO is too high, the photographer has set shutter speed and aperture settings incorrectly for the situation. Here's a practical example. This scenario is wildlife, but the principles apply to any genre. On my recent trip leading a workshop in Botswana, on our last morning, we woke up to find lions drinking at the water hole next to camp. That's right, breakfast with lions in the background. It was awesome. It was 20 minutes before sunrise. It was quite dark. I pulled out my camera and adjusted the aperture to its widest setting on my 600mm f4 lens, and then my shutter speed until the ISO read 2500. That's right, I adjusted the shutter speed to get the ISO to an acceptable level. My shutter speed was one eighth of a second. You may be saying, that's slow for a wildlife, isn't it? Yes, but that's all the light the scene had available. Using an exposure equivalence calculator, I see that at 1 640th of a second, more realistic wildlife settings, the ISO would have been 200,000. So this is an exaggerated example of the problem. People use settings that they want rather than what the scene will allow that force the camera to use very high ISOs to get the exposure right. And when the ISO gets too high, say that it's the camera's fault. The camera is doing exactly what it's supposed to. The onus is on us, the photographer, to choose aperture and shutter speed settings that are appropriate for the light in the scene, to allow the camera to set an ISO that's appropriate. So in this case, one eighth of a second for me gave me ISO 2500. My aperture is already wide open at f4, it can't go any wider. Now I can go up to ISO 12,800 with a full frame camera at need, but less than 6,400 is nice for image quality. And at one eighth of a second, will all the photos be sharp? Nope. At 600 millimeters in a handheld, if there's any movement at all in the scene, even with no movement at times, the image will be blurry. In this case, less than half of them are sharp. Now what do you do when the light changes? About 10 minutes later, more lines came to drink and the light had improved a bit, closer to sunrise. To get the camera to select an ISO that was appropriate, I used a shutter speed of 1 100th of a second to get ISO 4000. At this shutter speed, a greater proportion of the shots will be sharp. Note that I adjusted the shutter speed to get the ISO ballpark where I wanted, somewhere between 3200 and 6400. I could have left the shutter speed at 1 8th of a second to get a lower ISO, but it was more important for me to get more shutter speed for sharper photos and freeze any movement. By the way, follow me on Facebook and Instagram as I almost always give a photo tip with every post. And sign up on my email list and I'll give you my guide on shooting in backlit situations for free. Link below. Now back to lions. Then they started fighting. Oh dear. Still before sunrise and there's fast action. A poor combination. I raised my shutter speed to 1 1 60th of a second. Still too slow, but that gave me ISO 6400 as high as I wanted to go. Again, I chose the ballpark ISO by setting the shutter speed to as high as I could for the available light. Will they all be sharp? No, but I'm as high as I can go for the light that I have to play with. A bit later, 1 800th of a second. Now we're getting close to enough shutter speed to freeze the action on a regular basis. ISO 5000. You get the drift. As the light improves, I could add more shutter speed to improve my odds of getting the shot but I never used too fast a shutter speed for the available light 
which would drive the ISO higher. And finally, later the same morning, an incredible surprise for the central Kalahari Desert. Not one cheetah, but six. A mum, three cubs, and two territorial males that came in to mark their dominance a bit aggressively. By then the light had improved so I could use one one thousandth of a second for these static shots, like this cub licking her mother, to one two thousandth for this running cheetah. Again, I only used this high shutter speed when I had enough light to allow the auto ISO to be at a reasonable setting. I even went to one thirty two hundredth of a second when the light improved even more and the action looked serious, giving me still ISO 1600. I hope you see now that while the camera in auto ISO is responsible for the exact ISO setting in every shot, you're responsible in setting the shutter speed and aperture to get the ISO available in at least ranges that are acceptable to you. And I promised you a bonus tip, and that's not to try and get too cute with keeping your ISO too low in action scenarios with auto ISO, especially in shooting in bright light or shooting back lit. What do I mean by that? This is because for auto ISO to work, it needs to be able to move up and down to get the exposure right. But note, most cameras can't go under ISO 100. So if your proper ISO setting should be 50 or 10 to properly expose the photo, it can't go that low and you end up overexposing your photo. Here's a real example. I again was shooting these red leshways into the setting sun on auto ISO. The first shot was at ISO 200, no problem. But as the subject ran into and across the setting sun, the ISO goes down as it should. ISO 160, 125, 100. But look what happens next. The ISO can't go lower than 100, so the highlights in the photo start getting overexposed. That leads to clipping. The moral of the story, if you're going to risk shooting into bright lights, maybe a lighted music venue, sunset shoot, or cloudy with sunny periods, start with the shutter speed that gives you an ISO high enough to have room to go lower. Don't start at settings that give you a really low ISO like 200 if there's a chance that the brightness of the scene will go up a lot. Start at settings where the auto ISO is at 500 for example or so for more room. Remember that in concert with any semi-automatic modes like auto ISO, mastering exposure compensation is the best thing you can do to get to the next level. Check out my video on that right here. If you found this video deserving, give it a like and YouTube will show it to even more photographers, helping them use auto ISO. And I hope that you can use these tips the very next time you go out to get your own unique and amazing photos. I know you can do it.